what I'd like to do now is to just take a short walk down to the edge of this field and show you where an old bracket dam is and see if you can actually take you close. We'll see if you can pick out some of the things to look for to help you identify that. And then if we'll come back here and we'll uh, let some of you try the cross cut stuff. I'm just going to go over the lip here just a little bit. Okay, what I want you to do is I want you to look around the area and see if you can see anything that jumps out that you think might be associated with a lumber operation. They look around, some of them are really obvious, others you might have to strain your neck a little bit. Okay, yeah, we're looking at this, this pile of dirt right here, dirt and rocks. If you look over here, we've got an old pile of dirt and rocks on the other side of that little little stream right there. Okay, this pile of earth and dirt is part of that uh, part of that bracket dam. There's also some other stuff that's pretty obvious right around here. We're not just looking at the pile of dirt. What else do we have? Yeah, the wood. Here's an obvious one. This log is buried down into the into the bank like this. There's another one that's buried here. Another one here. If we look over on this side, back this water up. In the mill, the main mill, I believe, was right here up on this flat. And we'd back the water up up this channel here. And a lot of this has been manipulated over the years with the state and all that, making facilities and stuff. But if if you go on the other side of the stream, matter of fact, if you look in this direction, you can see that little grassy area on the right side of the stream. And if you look further down, you can see, uh, if you look closely, you can see the bridge those people are going to hopefully walk across right there. Okay. Right underneath that bridge is another side channel. All right, They would have channeled water through there for this mill operation. And if we look across the stream on the other side, you can see another pile of rocks over there. There was actually, a, and then you go on the other side of the road, there was an old house that was up on that hilltop as well. So the big thing is if you can pick out these mounds of dirt on both sides of the stream and these submerged logs. And I know if you go further upstream, there's at least three others, um, not quite as, let's say, as easily visible as this, but Cobtown has another one that if you walk back in there, you'll pick that out. Now that you know what to look for here, it's mostly earth that you're looking at. See, still see logs embedded in here. Okay, if you've, anybody seen uh, Anthony Cook's book, Cook Forest, An Island in Time? All right, uh, it's got a, a lot of excellent historical photos of this area back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and actually shows this site and another one. They had another uh, splash dam downstream. If you know where the swinging bridge is, if you were to stand on a swinging bridge and look upstream, you can see the remnants of another splash dam down there, okay? Even on some of the side drainages, as you go further up Tom's Run, you go up Heffern Run, comes in, the first stream, if you go up Tom's Run Road, Little first little bridge across is Hepford Run. If you go up that run, there's little remnants of smaller side dams. And to bring the to raise this water level up, they wouldn't just break this one. They would oftentimes make it a series of breaks. They may even have telegraph. They had telegraph back then. And some of the bigger longer lumber operations, they'd have the guy up there, bracket bridge, the uh, bracket cutter would be up there starting to break on that dam, and they'd get the water flowing. And they wanted to have nice one continuous break sometimes. But they wanted to just take out all these dams. Now, is this for moving the wood here or down there? It depends on where they had it. They could use this here to also move the move the logs down there. But sometimes they would probably have a pile of logs in this pond, another pile of logs higher up on another pond, to join in the another lake. pile of logs down there. Yeah, you just you just keep raising the water level and keep floating them out. But here, I mean, this this little on the other side of this. Uh, right where the water is over here, it's, it's deeper than other sections. It might be, you know, about up to your thighs. But imagine the water level being about at least as high as the uh, ground level here. And moving all that water downstream would be quite a torrent. And even when we have really big rainstorms or, you know, all the snow decides to melt virtually all at once, it'll come up over the banks down here, which would be just about enough to start to uh, move some of those big logs downstream. Um, Anybody have any questions? So the water would break, and all, they'd have all the wood, and it all go. The water and the wood would all go together, and, yeah. then, and then there would be no water after that. It'd be for back a while. down to I this mean, level. I yeah. see. How many men did Crooks employ here? Oh, they had a lot. They actually had a boarding house down there beside the cook, between the cook bed. Actually, the boarding house was in, was in the parking lot of the park office, and you could probably have put 60 guys in that boarding house easy. 
And it was nice working for the cooks because they gave you a, you had a house to live in. If you worked in other lumber companies, I mean, you might be, they might take you on a train partly out, you know, it'd be good 20 miles out and dump you on the end of that train track and you had to put some uh, logs together to form a makeshift cabin. And you may have 60 men on that team, but in a cabin no bigger than a log cabin that we were just by to start with. And uh, I mean, you know, guys, without our wives around, we tend to revert back to being slobs. And so, you know, we don't shower every day. You know, they certainly didn't take a bath every day in the stream. Once a week, maybe on a Sunday. But, uh, you know, you're out there working. As long as it was sun out, you were working out in the forest. When it was dark, you'd be sharpening your tools and getting ready for the next day. And sometimes living with a bunch of smelly guys, some of the guys would rather sleep up on top on the roof than sleep inside with everybody else. So uh, there's a... Them huge timber, did they send them down the river too or not? Some of them they would. It depends on what they wanted to do. Some like if they had like a hundred foot log they wanted, they might have a special set of team of oxen. And that kind of rarely happened around here. But they might have to have a special team of horses or, or, or you know, horse or oxen to get them to a type of, get them to a railroad. The closest here would be going up towards Leaper. 66, okay? If you're further up river on the Clarion, they had the Clarion River Railway, but it didn't come down below Halton, I believe. Not much further below. Well, it did come down below Halton, but not too much further. I, I think at Belltown, at best, oh, would be Bowling the terminus. Would be in the Pardon me? Bowwinkle would be the closest. Bowwinkle, yeah. So they would, if they had a big log or series of long logs they wanted to keep, they'd have to get it up to the train track to move it because trying to get that whole log down the stream uh, in a log drive is miserable. So they would probably, if they wanted to ship it down river, they would probably have a series of oxen drag it down to the river, something of that size. But oftentimes you're looking at maybe a 60 foot log or shorter, and they could do that down these side streams. How long a timber could be hot? Well, through a mill, it, it would depend. Oh, they could, they could probably, oh yeah, they could saw a 20 foot log. If you go into the sawmill center, uh, they have a really nice, really great piece of timber, and you'll never see this unless, let's say, you go out west where there's still sawing trees like this. But uh, if you go into Sawmill Center in the, the uh, well, this craft market now, the main two big doors, and you go along that back wall, they have a long timber along that back wall. It's uh, it's probably about, about a one, it's about a one by 12 by about 40 feet long. Single piece of wood, not glued together. You know, we make our tables and stuff. We've got little pieces of wood that we glue together to make a nice long table. Or we've got plywood that we wood chip it and we blow it all together and stick it in a nice piece, flat, flat piece of wood. But back then, that's the kind of timber you'd be cutting. You could cut one inch thick, 12 inches in diameter, 60 feet long. I mean, and that was common back then. Well, what's kind of neat is if you saw our, uh, we did a French uh, Marine character back in the 1750s yesterday and the muskets that we had the kids use were made from that original white pine, some of the original white pine that was left that was actually underneath the sawmill center down there. And you look at those little little toy muskets that they're using, and you got 80 years of wood in these little spans about this long, some of them. All right, so that was very highly prized timber, okay? Three, four, five, four hundred some year old trees are still there. But in other sections of forest that they did partially harvest, let's say they just took out the white pine. Let's say like this opposite ridge line. I believe they took out mostly probably the white pine, but they left everything else. They left the old hemlock, the old black cherry, the old white oaks, and the red oaks. And uh, we've got hemlock over here that are pushing 300, black cherry over 200. We have the tallest known black cherry in the northeast United States over here, just under 140 feet high. And that one's about 12 feet around, circumference. All right, and if we could get just one of those logs for veneer quality, you'd probably be looking at about $30,000 for one log of that quality. Okay, and uh, it's just amazing. But a lot of these big trees, you know, you think, oh boy, some people will go up here on a walk, and some people say well, we should never ever cut any tree. And other people will walk up there with us and they say it's just, oh, it's a huge waste of money. This all should have been cut years ago. Okay, I'm gonna work my way back up the log if anybody wants to test their skill out on the uh, cross cut shop, cross, two man cross cut. We'll give you a chance at that.